Today on Twincam, we're heading back down the advertising rabbit hole because I'm a nerd, and chances are you probably are too. But recently on my channel, we've been seeing quite a lot of my Austin Metro, and not quite so much of Melvin, my little poverty spec Rover Metro. So while I'm busy tinkering away behind the scenes, let's give the K-Series Metro a bit of attention with a look at this 1991 Rover Metro brochure. I've had my white Metro for over five years now, which is pretty scary in itself. But what that means is that I've encountered a lot of people through the car, so I'm pretty well versed in people's reactions to it. And that's usually something along the lines of, you don't see many of those anymore, and they'd be right. But after that, the conversation either dies very quickly, or they try and be insightful. And it's with option two that the observer can very quickly make themselves look very knowledgeable, or very stupid. Let me explain. Popular culture would have you believe that they rebadged it, you fool. And to a point, that is true. But quite by accident, by owning both A and K series metros, as well as coming across virtually all of the contemporary motoring magazines, I've realised that I own two cars that look the same, but feel like they're from totally different eras. And that's our starting point for this, because if you've been bored enough to watch my ramblings on old car brochures before, you may have seen some, no, sorry, lots of Austin Rover brochures pop up. If you haven't, or need a reminder, I'll put a card up in the corner that links over to one, and they're usually quite messy. There's nothing wrong with them per se, and most other manufacturers did a very similar thing, but from 1989 onwards, the marketing team at Rover completely revolutionised all of their media. To demonstrate this here, I also have a 1980 Metro brochure, from the year the original car launched. And the difference in technique is startling, because in this newer brochure, all of the colour has gone. All the delicate angles of photography, all the attempts to drag an interest out of a potential customer are gone. Instead, we're presented with an oversized brochure, produced with thick paper and a clean white cover. We have a very simple title with the corporate Rover badge and the name of the car. Seemingly, nothing else. But look closely. Tilt the brochure. And I hope you can see it glinting in the light. I can't think of the word for this, but the Rover Longship is glossy in the cover. The simplicity of the cover, along with the incredible elegance in its execution, all exudes confidence and premium products. Rover has changed, and they're not afraid of that. In fact, the elegance and confidence are repeated here, highlighting the Rover mark above all, with its deep burgundy colour scheme, a 16-valve badge, immaculate build quality, which is not something that was consistent in their marketing previously, and a simple quote. The K-Series Metro was so well received by the motoring press that Autocar had no reservations in declaring it to be the best small car in the world. As I mentioned, this brochure is from 1991, over 12 months after the car was launched in May 1990. And that gave Rover the time to add things like that quotation in, as well as a number of trim changes and improvements as we'll come to see, and some nerds may already notice on this page. Because unlike any BL or Rover brochure before, this one is more than happy to dedicate a full page to just a photograph and it is gorgeous. In the shot, we have two sporty metros with the All The Show GTA on the left and the Full Fat GTI on the right. But it's the setting that tells us all we need to know. It's expertly choreographed with the shadows, the lighting, the glinting on the badges, and of course, the framing itself. Metros, I think, only really look good from very low down. And we'll see throughout this brochure that the marketing people knew this. So every photograph 
is taken looking up at the cars because they have presence this way. We're three pages in and this is marketing perfection. There are no cringy taglines, no telling the customer what to think, just quiet confidence, a quote from an independent source, and the customer now thinks that this is a premium company. This is the preserve of the upper middle class, even if it really isn't. Page four, and we finally have some text. But we have to talk about photography again first, because this is just beautiful. There are no distractions in it. Our focus is clearly brought to the dashboard, but we see it through the sunroof aperture, as if we're taking our first peek into the cabin of the car. The background is inky black, and we can only see the silhouette of the car's bonnet as it fades away into the night. The interior itself is really warmly lit, and of course the dash illumination is on, so we see the features despite the relative darkness. And the external lighting acts with the camera in a way to make the Rover badge, yet again, glint. And within this text is the supreme pulling power that an article like that in Autocar can bring. Because now the usual marketing spiel begins, but it's with reliable backing. The Rover Metro, acclaimed as the finest small car in the world. Powerful, refined, with all the quality of Rover engineering. Now offering sporting drivers the exhilaration of the new 103 horsepower Metro GTI 16 valve. With the Rover twin cam 16 valve engine fed by multi-point fuel injection, giving you a new experience in high performance. Responsive yet refined, power that helps to care for the environment with an advanced three-way controlled exhaust catalyst fitted as standard. Minimising emissions at no cost to the exceptional performance and excellent fuel economy. And in those few sentences, we've ascertained that the new Metro has been proclaimed the best in the world by the oldest motoring magazine, has a decent turn of speed with over 100 brake horsepower, has bang up to date engineering with 16 valves and fuel injection, and is environmentally responsible with a catalytic converter. All of these things differ the car enormously from its predecessor, as the A-Series Metro, though a decent car in 1980, was already way out of date by 84, as it was roundly overtaken by the likes of the Vauxhall Nova, the Peugeot 205 and the Mark II Ford Fiesta. But here was a new car, that despite sharing the body shell was so different under the skin that it single-handedly overtook what had, until this point, been seen as the king in the Peugeot and the all-new Mark III Fiesta that was launched in 89. And now we can head into the interior. And again, moody lighting, features highlighted, and while on the last page we saw a Metro GTA, here we have a Metro GTI. And that means there's just a glimpse of what I think is one of the coolest seat patterns of all time, what Rover termed lightning. In the text at the bottom of the page, they talk about the aura of the car and the driving position, which actually isn't too bad, and had been severely revised from the old A-Series car. But I don't think everything they did was good. So the seats are mounted in the same place as they always were, but the pedals and steering column were both moved to address some of the complaints. I'm not 100% sure whether the clutch and brake pedals were moved, but the throttle pedal on the K-Series Metro is way further over to the left. And this means two things. First, it doesn't hit the wheel arch, so the travel in it is more natural and your ankle aches less. The second is that it's much closer to the brake, and that means that the pedals are perfectly placed for heel and toe down changes. They aren't on an Austin, but they are on a Rover. These are the things that only a Metro owner notices, because owning both and driving them back to back really illuminates the work that went into correcting all the little faults of the original. But the steering column adjustments are a little more questionable. 
The old car, and virtually every front-drive BL car before it, was criticised for having a very upright steering column, making it feel like a bus to drive. So for the Rover Metro, they put a universal joint in it, making it come out of the dash at a much more natural rake. Sounds good, but in doing this, the column jolts off to the left. So in a K-Series Metro, you feel as though the steering wheel is pointed towards the centre of the car, which in my opinion, is worse than it pointing at the sky. So a bit hit and miss, but they did put the effort in, and that's continued into the dashboard. Though it's fundamentally the same design as the old car, it's modified to stop it warping, with a different mounting system below the windscreen. And all the switches have been revised around the instrument cluster, so now all the controls are at your fingertips, and they're really high quality. But you're just going to have to take my word for that one. And it's another Metro GTI. All we've seen so far are the hot models, and of course that's completely on purpose. Now compare this to an old MG Metro Turbo, and the body kit is completely different. The MG had wheel arch extensions, but they've been replaced here with side skirts that improve the stance a bit. And there's a lot more black plastic about as opposed to the full body colour bumpers and wing of the old one. And as I mentioned the stance, look at the ride height. Rover are being really cheeky here, because metros sit up in the gods in real life, but they've drained the hydrogas system to make them look lower. I'm not sure how they got away with that. With a full view of the interior, Rover begins talking about this roverization of the metro, with all the usual stuff about large car qualities encapsulated within the compact body style. As is usual for small car brochures, but in the next paragraph, they discuss the seats, which are rather phenomenal. They're incredibly comfy and very supportive, especially on the shoulders, as I'll attest to. But what we can see here is that even though the front seats have been shunted forwards, there isn't very much room in a Metro. By 1990, it was the smallest Super Mini available, so nobody bought a Metro for people or load carrying. And with the addition of big, comfy seats, there's just no room in the back. A fully grown adult can't really get comfy in the back of a K-Series Metro. And this is where we see the general age of the body shell shining through, even if the car itself has suddenly become brilliant, as we're reminded of up here. Page 12, and we're finally seeing a normal Metro, a 1.1L in this case, which is one up from base. And I think Rover did a pretty good job of updating the Metro. While it does still have ancient parts like the gutters, the sills, and the rear wheel arch design, the front end was bang up to date for the early 90s. And while I think a Mark I or Mark II Fiesta is a much better looking car than an Austin Metro, I think that role is reversed as we enter the 90s. The Mark III Fiesta lacks finesse, and the Rover Metro, despite the old shell, has that in abundance. This page also introduces us to the major engineering differences between old and new. They tell us that this is a powerful car for its class, with a choice of Rover designed and built all aluminium engines. A delight to drive because they're responsive, eager and smooth, a pleasure to own because the modern design has also made them fuel efficient, quiet and kinder to the environment. You will find the Rover engineered 4 and 5 speed gearboxes equally enjoyable, giving fast, precise gear changing and refined motorway cruising. Oh, it's so cool. I love this kind of photo. It just, it just does something. And if you ever wondered where the Twin Cam logo comes from, well here you have it. It's from the cam cover of a 16 valve K-Series. Not only was 1990 the first time the Metro got 4 valves per cylinder, but also fuel injection, initially single point, but by mid-91, the time of this brochure, you could also get multi-point. 
So there were actually two Metro GTIs on offer at this point, and we'll see that fleshed out when we get to the specifications. Despite the issues that came along later, the K-Series was a fabulous engine, and its use in a plethora of sports cars is testament to its characteristics, because it's very revvy, very responsive, very smooth, pretty powerful, and exceptionally light. I'm led to believe that the K-Series weighs about half as much as the old A-Series did. Now, I'm not sure about the gearbox situation there, but it is significantly lighter. The result is a power output of 103 horsepower and sporting performance. The new Metro GTI 16 valve can reach 60 miles per hour in only 8.6 seconds and achieve a top speed of 116 miles per hour. Exceptional power delivered with a refinement rare among small cars but characteristic of a Rover. So over the page are the range of K-Series petrol engines with yet more brilliant photography and a sectioned power unit over here on the right. And this very engine is on display at the British Motor Museum. The range is 1.1 or 1.4 litre, either 8 or 16 valves, and a carburettor, single point fuel injection or multi point fuel injection. So there's a decent old range of power outputs on offer here. And this page also gives us both the best and worst of the K-Series. Up at the top we have the good, as Autocar said that the 1.1 K-Series engine turned out to be a gem. Willing, refined and amazingly free revving, the gear change snappy and slick, the cabin far more comfortable and plushly appointed than anyone has been anticipating. In short, the Rover was a revelation. But with the benefit of hindsight, while taking into account how brilliant these engines are when they're working, there's a passage down here that describes a feature that made the K-Series famous for all the wrong reasons. The units have a classic all-aluminium construction, which gives them the advantages of lightweight and good thermal characteristics, contributing both to performance and economy. This is partly due to the efficient cooling system design, which speeds warm-up time by minimising coolant capacity. It also enhances fuel economy by giving a consistent temperature across the whole of the engine. So the K-Series, despite its issues, was the major engineering change for the new Metro. But the rest of the car also fundamentally changed. In fact, none of the suspension componentry is carried over from the old car. Everything is different, even if the basic system and philosophy is the same. The hydrogas system was retained, but one of the big issues with the original Metro was the fact that it was very weirdly set up. The designer of the system, Sir Alex Moulton, specified that it should be independent side to side, but interlinked front to rear. And up until 1980, every hydrolastic or hydrogas equipped car had been linked that way. But the Metro was independent at the front and interlinked at the rear side to side, and that completely altered the characteristics of the system. So while the car still handled well, it was nowhere near as comfortable as it should have been, and it had far more roll. In the mid-1980s, Alex Moulton owned an Austin Metro, and he took it on himself to modify the system, linking it correctly, and he took his own personal car to Austin Rover for them to evaluate. And predictably, it was a revelation. So when the Rover Metro was launched in 1990, it had the correct style of interlinking for the hydrogas system to work properly. So it was much comfier, much more composed, and cornered flatter than the old car. But the interlinking was only part of the changes, as the whole front suspension is different, because the Austin had spindly little suspension arms, much like a Mini. But for the Rover, they gave the Metro proper, beefy wishbones, and that made the handling much sharper and more sure-footed. So these little Metros all have double wishbone front suspension. 
The changes were so big, in fact, that Rover could remove the front anti-roll bars that were fitted to all A-Series cars and keep them in reserve for just the GTA and GTI. The secret of this accomplished road behaviour lies in a unique suspension design. Whilst the rear wheels are fully independent of each other, their suspension units are interconnected to those at the front of the car. The advantage of the system is that as a front wheel rises to absorb a bump, the rear wheel is forced down by fluid travelling to the rear suspension unit. This provides a far more level ride platform for the passenger compartment. The result is that the Rover Metro offers a combination of fluid ride, handling and refinement which is simply unequalled among small cars. Qualities such as these have played a major role in earning the Metro its unique reputation. Drive it and discover the difference. Before we move on, I have to note that this is the only page where we see Melvin Spec, the basic 1.1C model here with this red car. Obviously, they don't want you to see the hubcaps or the three-piece rear bumper because they're very old-fashioned and undesirable, but you can just see the hubcap on this offside front wheel. And from the base model, we suddenly go up to the top with the wood and leather clad Metro 1.4 GS. It's a bit too much for me because leather isn't as nice a material as velour, but it's astonishing that Rover felt both the need and ability for the Metro to pull off such an extravagantly up-spec interior finish. A few pages ago I mentioned the overall size of the car, or lack of it more correctly, and on this page Rover try and bypass that by talking all about the Metro's space efficiency. And I'll give it to them, the Metro is a very space efficient car. But if you need practicality in a small car, there's no saving grace for it. And with the boot, Metros do have a big old load lip. But nodding back again to the engineering, and this quote from What Car magazine relays my statements. Don't be fooled by the Metro's familiar looks. Virtually every moving part is new. Metro is a doddle to park, handy in traffic, and a giant killer on the open road. And on this page we have what might potentially be my favourite spec for the K-Series Metro. A three-door 1.4 SL in British Racing Green. So it has these cool aero-style wheel trims, bright inserts in the bumpers and rubbing strips, most of the luxury specifications, being one below the GS, and the 1400cc engine, which makes this car faster than an old MG Metro. And it looks so classy. Now we move on to in-car entertainment, and here are the range of units you could get in 91. It is slightly interesting to note that at this point you still couldn't get a CD player in a Metro. I know that cassettes were still the norm at this point, but CD sales were very high by 91, and they'd well overtaken vinyl by this point, so it seems slightly odd that they didn't at least offer one. Especially as you could spec a bigger Rover with a CD player, or even a CD changer. But despite this, the Philips R682 stereo radio cassette on the left here is rather nice for 1991, with noise reduction and RDS as well as this style of display. As was becoming a much bigger deal in this period, Rover made a point of the Metro's environmental credentials. Now, there's no big news here, but it's interesting to note at least that 1990 was the first year that the Metro was available with a Catalyst, and I think it might have been the first Super Mini to get one, but I'm not sure on that, so correct me if I'm wrong. But such was the occasion that all Catalyst-equipped Metros came with a badge on the back to tell you so. Unleaded fuel had been a thing in the UK since 1989, so it had to be compatible. But this wasn't always the case with the Metro, as pre-89 A-Series cars couldn't run on it, 
So my 87 Austin Metro, for example, needs a lead substitute if I'm not to wear out the valve seats. More of that double exposure trick on this page. But unlike the GTIs we've seen previously, this is a single point injection model. So it has the lattice alloys, which I think are cooler, and the different style of air cleaner to the car we saw the first time this photographic trick was used. And over on the right is a simple 8-valve carburetor-fed Metro. Finally then, we get towards the end. And all the specifications of the individual models, so in the centre, at the bottom, is that lightning trim from the GTI that I love so much. But at the top left is Harlequin, the trim pattern my little Melvin has. But I don't think they do it much justice here, because in real life it's really vibrant and screams at you to tell you it's from the early 90s. And across the page are the wheel trims, with Melvin style over here on the left. When the new Metro was launched in 1990, the 1.1C had the same wheel trims as the 1.1L, these starfish ones. But they developed these older looking trims in order to encourage people to buy the more expensive version. They made the car look worse on purpose, and that's so very Rover. But 30 years on, I love them. I just think they're so cool. But the big news of this page is up at the top, with the engines. Because the old 1.3 litre A-series produced 62 brake horsepower, and that was, outside the Van der Plas and MGs, the big engine. The powerful choice. But now, the smaller K-series makes 60 horsepower, and the standard 1.4K makes 75, which is more than the old MG, with even the warm Metro, the GTA 16 valve, making very nearly as much as the old Metro Turbo. So although Rover never produced a Metro to compete with the likes of the 205 GTI or Fiesta RS Turbo, the power outputs had bumped up significantly from the old car, and it was at the bottom of the range that this made the biggest difference. Because a basic Fiesta, for example, had to make do with its wheezy Kent engine and about 44 brake horsepower. But the basic Metro had the smooth Revy K-series and 60 brake horsepower. So in this period, the Metros were far more advanced, far more refined and much faster than their major competition. More options and specifications over the page here, so if you'd like to see any of them in detail, then just pause the video now. But I want to draw your attention to the dimensions. Because all the underskin improvements had a direct impact on the Metro's size. Despite the fact that the shell remained the same, everything from the bulkhead forwards was new. So the K-Series Metros are physically longer than their predecessors, and they have a longer wheelbase. So if you ever see an A and K-Series Metro parked near each other, take a look at the front wings. The gap between the door and the front wheel is clearly bigger on the Rover. So, some more specifications, and there we are. Just over two years ago, I had no car brochures. I was never a kid that would go around to car dealers and pilfer brochures from them, and I certainly didn't buy them from the internet. But now, primarily thanks to the kindness of you lot, I have quite a few. But this early 90s Rover brochure, which was thrown in when I bought Little Melvin, really wowed me. As a history student, I found this kind of stuff very, very interesting, and so I started collecting. Now, I wouldn't say I have a big collection of brochures, it's only quite small. But this series of early 90s Rover brochures remain, in my opinion, the best ever made. They exude an enormous sense of class and elegance, and to all the people on the team that created these, I doff my cap to you. And on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.